Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 30th, and we will hear the presentation Increasing Affordable Housing Production by Modernizing State Laws and Prioritizing Funding uh, in California. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the chat box. And uh, we will answer all of those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. So don't raise your hand or anything, just type your questions in. Uh, and it would help me if you could put in there who you want to answer the question, if you want someone specific to answer it. Coming up next on your screen, a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2021. Thanks to all, all of those participating sponsors for possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored by, by APA's Housing and Community Development Division. So thanks to them for hosting today, and we are looking forward to this session. Here is a list of some of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these and all of them at our web slash planning webcast. We have one date left uh, for 2021. So we have a great lineup ahead this fall. Be sure to check back our webcast website to register for, for these and more. And has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. You you can log your CM credits by heading over to planning.org. You log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or your event number by ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And if you're on social media, make sure you like us on Facebook. That's where I post any time or time change. I also post when we have new sessions available for you to register for. So be sure to search for us, just search planaries and we'll pop up. We record all of our sessions, including today's, and we post it on our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to us and you will get notified when we have new sessions up and available for you. Just search planning webcast series again. We will pop up along with our open over 350 recordings that are available for you to view for free. So that is the end of my housekeeping items. Again, and don't forget to type your questions in the chat box if you think of them. We will answer as many of those as we can when we get to the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. I'm going to turn the controls over to today's team. And you should have that. And Jeff Ross. Thank you. And good morning or afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are in the country. For those of you in the afternoon, a little jealous, you're closer to the weekend than I am. Um, really excited to be able to present today uh, to you all, all of the work that we've been uh, doing out here in California as it relates to really trying to provide more affordable housing and to really be able to um, be able to make sure that we have Hold on one second. Okay. There we go. Uh, trying to make sure that we're really able to address our homelessness issue um, and our affordability issue out here within the state of California. Um, it is, it uh, goes without saying that, you know, roughly 20% of all homeless uh, individuals in the country are in California. And that is for various reasons. Um, over the last several decades in terms of challenges and obstacles that we've um, that we've had to deal with and that we've been trying to make sure that we address. And so uh, this morning, what we'll hey, do Jeff, is- Hey all of a sudden, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no um, all of a sudden, it, we did this test, or breaking up a little bit, and I don't know if anyone else is catching that or if it's just me. So I did, I turned your webcam off just to try to strengthen your sound. 
Um, but when you turn it over um, next to, to Sasha, um, I'm going to send you some directions to maybe use your telephone to call in. I don't know why all of a sudden you're, you're breaking up a little bit, but your, your telephone will help. Got it. Will do. So, um, next slide, Sasha. Okay. So, to kind of jump into it, one of the things that we've been focused on in California is that we know that homelessness is solvable, but it requires a tremendous amount of work, a lot of focus. We have to work collaboratively together with, with partners in, in all communities, government, nonprofit, private sector. Um, and we just have to really be willing to be flexible and understand the needs on, on the street. And we've really focused at, you know, the pandemic really uh, made a challenging situation so much worse, but it also created an opportunity for us to really come at it in a way that we've never been able to, to necessarily go and, and try and tackle it before. And so we've tried to make sure as we've gone through this process that we've really laid a groundwork that is um, allows us to take the lessons learned, positive and negative, and to really be able to push forward and continue to address the needs within our state. And what we're finding is that a lot of these lessons are really transferable around uh, the country and even internationally as we've had good conversations with partners uh, in Europe and Asia around uh, some of the challenges that we all face trying to make sure that we protect it and, and uh, support our most vulnerable populations. Um, a lot of this work, and this comes no surprise uh, to planners, is requires regional and statewide coordination. Housing markets are a regional asset and they require us to make sure that um, you know, we approach housing with that lens. It, it also means that um, we have to look at all the processes that we uh, usually go through to provide housing and really not be stuck to the way we've been doing things, but to really uh, explore and evaluate what can change, what can we do different, what can we do faster without reducing quality. Um, it's really important that what we're trying to do is create permanent solutions that really uh, honor the dignity of all of our fellow uh, residents throughout our communities. And, and that means that we don't want to set up uh, substandard housing solutions. We don't want to have um, solutions that don't really get at and provide the necessary supports and access um, to, to the, the folks that we're trying to serve and that do not honor the surrounding community. We, we need these to become assets. Th these solutions need to be assets, not only for the, for the households and, and individuals we're trying to serve, but for their neighbors. And so th these are incredibly important things that we've been working very hard over the last year to make sure that we address. And of course, during the uh, pandemic, it emphasized that housing is healthcare, um, that improved health outcomes um, are a direct result of having a roof over your head and a door to close at night so that you can really de-stress, relax, uh, be able to unwind, to, to do all the things that allows folks to be able to focus and function and to be able to do the work that they need to do to, to really you know, participate fully uh, in, in our community and society. Next slide, please. So like all of you, Last year in, in March, you know, home, uh, the pandemic really came home. And, you know, we all started to begin to understand what we were dealing with. Uh, first time in, in our modern uh, experience of having to deal with uh, an airborne virus that was highly transmittable and really impacted uh, the health of, of our communities. And so in California, we uh, created a two prongs uh, approach to trying to address both the immediate need of the pandemic and the long-term need of serving our most vulnerable populations. We created a temporary program called Room Key that really focused on bringing folks that were on the street or in congregate shelters into uh, more uh, non-congregate, individualized, uh, non-shared housing and, and shelter environments. And, and the way we did that 
was really focusing on the utilization of hotels and motels. In the pandemic, we saw uh, you know the utilization rates uh, within the travel industry diminish dramatically, and so it really provided a an opportunity for us to expand our services uh, rapidly and to make sure that we could support uh, individuals and bring them out of um, being unsheltered or in these in these shared congregate spaces and allow for them to be protected from the virus and cared for all at the same time. This was a partnership between the federal government and the state and the federal government. We uh, used our FEMA reimbursement, our coronavirus fund, and other state resources to really be able to pay for and, and make sure that we could operate these these facilities. In all, we were able to mobilize 23,000 hotel motel rooms um, and really be able to serve uh, upwards of 16,000 to 17,000 different households uh, throughout, throughout the, uh, the process. So this really made uh, a dramatic impact uh, immediately as our, our services for um, serving the homeless. Now, many of us in our communities have dealt with and understand that we, that we uh, or that we can Sorry, I'm picking up some background noise there. Um, if, if, if you can please be on mute, thank you. A lot of us know and have been working on hotel motel conversions, uh, have been working on uh, reutilizing under underutilized and, and vacant sites. We've looked at converting commercial spaces. This is work that we've all done um, in bits and pieces over you know the last several decades. Um, Again, with the pandemic, what it's done throughout the marketplace is really kind of speed up a conversion that we've already seen occurring as more and more uh, services and amenities uh, have had to transition from, you know, whether it is uh, strip malls for our shopping, uh, whether it is uh, commercial spaces, office commercial spaces that are reaching the end of their useful life. Um, same with the hotels and motels, some, you know, needing to be repositioned, their ultimate uh, viability, you know, uh, beginning to wane. This pandemic has sped up that uh, process, and it has provided a lot of opportunities for us to come in and reimagine the use of these spaces at the same time that we could then provide immediate, long-term, permanent services and solutions to our vulnerable populations. And that was the framework and groundwork for uh, creating the HomeKey program. Last July, uh, we, we launched HomeKey. It ultimately became an $846 million effort using the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, 50, uh, that was $750 million in Coronavirus Relief Fund uh, dollars, $50 million in California uh, State General Fund dollars, and $46 million and philanthropic dollars that really allowed us to acquire and convert uh, spaces rapidly and create operational subsidies. So that way we could create an immediate uh, permanent solution uh, to housing for our, our homeless and vulnerable populations and create the space necessary for us to ultimately reposition properties for the long term uh, so that they really become um, assets to our community. And it's important to note in California, when, we, when we're purchasing units and we're subsidizing units, we do this with a 55 year use restriction. So we had to be able to make sure that we brought units online. And uh, as, we, as we go through this morning's presentation, what you'll see is we purchased uh, our properties, we brought our units online, and we did that within roughly 90 days of uh, entering into agreements with our partners staggeringly fast process that we had to throw out the playbook um, to, to accomplish. But it also allowed us to make sure that we had long-term assets that we could reposition for 55 years. Ultimately, we were able to do in less than six months total time um, the acquisition of just over 6,000 units. Next slide, please. To do this, we also, as I mentioned, we were focusing on the permanent solution, the permanent housing. But to effectively do that, 
and to really serve those that we needed to, to truly serve, we had a focus on equity. Equity was at the very heart of everything that we were doing as part of the home team program. And this is important because we targeted our geography, we made sure our accessibility was all measured by bringing the groups, uh, in some cases that had never been at the table, to the table and made sure that they had a voice and that they were able to participate in a meaningful fashion. That included our tribes. That included communities that had never had a homeless facility or services in them before. And so, as you know, capacity in our different communities varies dramatically. It's not uncommon for planners or nonprofit community partners to be wearing multiple hats. What we needed to be able to do is to make sure that no matter where a community was, no matter what their current capacity and ability to do something is, if they wanted to participate, if they had a need, that we met them where they were at and we could uh, partner and serve with them. So this laser focus really allowed us to create partnerships and trust in a way that quite honestly, as a state organization, we hadn't been able to do before. And, and that really transformed and created a really uh, positive, interactive, collaborative uh, partnership that really uh, laid the foundation for the success that has been Home Key and for the future success that we're now working on on several new programs, including a second round of Home Key. Next slide, please. Again, Home Key has been a proof of concept. What we've accomplished has been done in smaller scales before and has been done in a, in a longer time frame. But what Homekey did was create a size and a speed and a scale of, of activity to address vulnerable households, homeless households, folks with chronic health conditions, and to provide permanent solutions that were cheaper um, to our service providers cost less overall to develop um, and really uh, created an overall you know framework that we could use and transfer and, and apply to several other programs and activities again to do this meant that we we couldn't approach it like the way that we we approach our our, our normal projects and processes we broke down our silo silos my my uh colleagues that will be speaking here shortly are all from different uh, parts of, of my department, and they are uh, they are a symbol of, of what we did in terms of making sure that we didn't leave barriers in place or that there were blockages in communication. This was about making sure that everyone had direct access, that decisions could be made quickly, and everyone was on the same page. And at the end of the day, uh, meeting uh, communities where they were meant that in some cases, we needed to keep a, a project uh, as, as a non-congregate shelter first and then allow for its conversion to permanent housing second. And what that ultimately has developed is that 85% of our projects, 85% of those 65 or 6,000 uh, units that were purchased will ultimately become permanent housing, but they didn't start off as permanent. So again, this was a dynamic program with uh, a lot of flexibility built in to make sure that we met communities, households, um, where they were and where their need was. Next slide, please. So again, we treated housing as a regional asset. We divided the state of California up into eight regions. Those eight regions had uh, their own allocation of funds. We worked very collaboratively with all interested applicants to make sure that they could get in and get their projects supported. Um, we built capacity through technical assistance, both directly by the department and our partners, uh, including uh, partnering with uh, you know, nonprofit and, and philanthropic partners to really make sure that uh, capacity could be uh, grown uh, for the long term. We really worked closely with the legislature and the governor's office to clear a path uh, uh, on land use and environmental, uh, you know, understanding that again, there there are things that we can, there are protections that we can make sure that we we honor and, and serve, but that we can streamline the process and, and the ability to deliver these these uh, much needed assets more quickly. Uh, again, 
partnering with philanthropics and having those community partners uh, with a meaningful engagement was tremendously important uh, to adding our overall capacity. And it really meant that our collaboration was much broader. And it has meant that we've been able to partner very effectively with uh, states across the country. And as I mentioned, we, we've had uh, partnerships now internationally. We've, we've had great uh, interactions and, and conversations with Japan, with Britain, with Spain. Um, and so there's those, those interactions also allow us to, to, to learn new things and to consider things that we might not have, have, have done as part of this initial effort. In all, California is an incredibly high cost state. Costs roughly anywhere from just under four hundred thousand to just under six hundred thousand dollars to create a new unit. HomeKey effectively created um, these six thousand units at a, at an average cost of one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So what we learned has saved costs. It has saved time. It has changed our process. And so that is 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 the the key pieces for us that we're trying to carry forward. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'm excited to hand uh, the next piece of the presentation over to Sasha. Sasha. Thanks, Jeff. My name is Sasha Wasatsky kurgan As this slide shows, I'm the Data and Research Unit Chief for our Division of Housing Policy Development at the Department of Housing and Community Development. I also am going to turn off my camera in just a second, uh, just to make sure that I don't drain capacity with my camera. Um, but I just want to note that uh, my team does data and research plus. So we do a lot of land use activities um, and certainly our policy division does. Um, most of our interaction is with the 539 cities and counties in the state of California. So it's with that lens um, that we brought our outreach and technical assistance approach to bear. And I'll talk about that and some of the land use tools over the next slides. So with that, I'm gonna turn off my camera. I'll see you in the Q&A um, and here's the next slide. Okay, great. So um, first up, I wanna start by really acknowledging some of the partnerships and collaboration, which Jeff discussed and enabled the program success. Aside from the coordination between our governor's office and our business consumer services and housing agency, which is the agency that it is over our department, we also worked closely with other departments in the state of California, including the Department of General Services. This builds on a partnership that we're doing um, to work on affordable housing development. But in the case of HomeKey, we brought in Department of General Services to provide technical assistance and their full range of real estate services to any of the applicants who needed support in navigating HomeKey. This state coordination allowed us to stretch further in support of local agency partners, which included cities and counties and tribes, housing authorities, and really, in HomeKey, our goal was to provide robust technical assistance and remove barriers to their participation in the program, essentially getting people to say yes to housing, getting yes to stepping into this space, even amidst a pandemic. I want to mention that planners were absolutely integral in this work from the state to the local level. Planners played a critical role in ensuring that local applicants could meet the program timelines and navigate our land use framework in the state. Unfortunately, California planners have already been focusing on accelerating housing production through some of our recent planning programs. I'll mention them briefly in a couple slides. But all this to say, this work required deep partnerships to achieve the outcomes that many doubted were possible in the time allotted and during the height of the pandemic. And so here's a little bit more about those outcomes. As Jeff mentioned, we created housing for more than 6,000 units, um, but that ultimately has already served more than 8,200 people. All of this through those partnerships uh, with more than 50 local agencies around the state. So 650 door, 6,050 doors acquired turned into almost 6,000 usable units or homes, over 120 project sites, all with a program that started in July contract signed by the end of 2020. And in housing development, this really is light speed and quite unheard of at this scale. And so we knew that there was interest in the program at the outset, but we couldn't be sure that we were gonna reach all areas of the state. And so in order to promote 
program access and support geographic equity, which was extremely important to us and mentioned in our authorizing statute. We wanted to make sure that within our state of 58 counties, we created a formula. Oh, I'm hearing some background noise. Okay, thanks. Um, we created a formula um, by region that was based on the 2019 point in time count of people experiencing homelessness and the number of extremely low income households that are at 30% of area median income or at the extremely low income um, level. So we did that in order to apportion both the, coronavirus, the federal coronavirus relief funds and our state general fund. And we held these funds by region for a short initial application period to do our best to fund pro projects throughout the state. And it worked. It worked better than we would have hoped. Um, and we did this um, not, to, not to hold projects back, but rather that we knew some partners were high capacity jurisdictions that were ready to go with sophisticated real estate teams on deck and they had the capacity to close on real estate deals, but we needed to ensure that we promoted geographic equity and access to the program and not just create an all out race to access these funds statewide that would effectively leave behind certain jurisdictions that may have really benefited from our TA to get them to step into the program. So still, we need to move quickly, as you've heard from us, and we'll keep hearing from us, I'm sure. So we brought some other tools to bear. Uh, before talking about some of the land use tools, I just want to mention that you know we brought our focus on certain planning initiatives and housing need that we've already been working on, especially since the passage of a, a really landmark housing package, legislative package, um, in 2017. So here's some way that we, we brought our focus and approach to, to planning and addressing housing in the state to bear in home key. So first, we focused on the facts that more than 50% of California renters are cost burden, meaning that they are spending more than 30% of their gross income on housing costs. Um, if we were to add in their transportation costs, we really get to extreme cost burden quite quickly. And then further, uh, we're not, we don't have enough housing stock to address that need. And what I mean is that the vast majority of cities and counties are not keeping pace with their planning goals to create housing at all in income levels, but we are furthest behind in creating affordable housing for lower income households. 81% of our cities and counties are not on track to meet their low income planning goals for housing. 91% of cities and counties are not on pace with their very low income housing goals. That's, that's for units that are at 50% of area median income. Uh, while we are very concerned and working hard to reverse that trend, I, it is important to note, this is a national trend. Uh, some of you may have seen the most recent report um, called Out of Reach from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which shows that a minimum wage worker cannot afford housing anywhere in the nation right now. So this is not just happening in California, um, but it's important to, to recognize what that, what that means for risk is that this scarcity not only ties to the rates of homelessness today, but it really suggests that there are additional pressures for increases in homelessness. And so when we compounded that with uh, the effects of the pandemic, we knew that we needed to bring our focus on addressing cost burden and the need for low-income housing into this program. Uh, so then, as you've heard uh, from Jeff and me, we really leveraged technical assistance to make sure that our local partners could step in to the program by removing barriers, by us removing barriers to participation through technical assistance. Um, I'm happy to say that we did as much as we could think of in the time allotted, in the time allotted um, we required one component of technical assistance, which was a pre-application consultation between the applicants and our team to make sure that we were working in lockstep from, from the jump. Um, all of our other technical assistance was optional, but again, this focus on removing barriers for jurisdictions as they had questions was really important to us. Um, one other partnership that we had was with the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, where we created our technical assistance 
and guidance on permit approvals and environmental review exemptions. Uh, we did that work product to ensure that we were really inclusive in considering how to bring housing online quickly and make sure that the people who needed to know how to do this were informed. So, uh, and then last, I just wanna mention that we have had other recent efforts to support planning grants for housing um, through our uh, planning grant program and a local early action planning program where we've already been working closely with jurisdictions in their work to accelerate housing production and also prepare them for our state's new pro-housing designation that we just launched. And so I can't emphasize enough that the work of planners to step into this process of removing barriers to housing production um, and that that was already in existence has most certainly helped home key outcomes. Um, and then very soon I'll talk about that specific land use and environmental exemption which supported this accelerated pace. Great. Uh, before then, I want to show you what uh, an example or a few examples of what this partnership and our, our program was able to support. So here we have uh, three profiles out of our 51 partners that we work with around the state. The first being from the city of Oakland who received three awards. Um, Oakland is an urban environment and they employed many different strategies to bring so many units online so quickly a total of 17 housing sites, um, both a scattered site model, um, an acquisition of a dorm, an acquisition of a hotel, and additionally those 15 family homes, which, which thankfully were serving large families um, experiencing or at risk of homelessness, which was a huge need in the city and in Alameda County. Um, so they, they took a multi-pronged approach to their work. <clears throat> As Jeff mentioned, we're really elated that we were able to um, work with several tribes, including the Yurok Nation in, in Northern California. Um, and their story is quite notable. Um, but I, I wanna focus just for a second that um, and acknowledge that there are many housing programs, not only in the state of California, which have explicit and implicit barriers to tribal participation uh, to make sure that tribes could participate, we were intentional in, at every step in removing those barriers within Home Key. Um, we have only just begun some of this though, and we will continue this effort. We have an Assembly Bill 1010, which passed in a, a couple ledge sessions ago to ensure better tribal access to HCD programs. Um, but through technical assistance and through so much motivation of the Yurok tribe and others, um, we were able to fund new homes um, for tribal members. Uh, the Housing Authority of Riverside, <clears throat> really thankful to have um, more than, I think, 10 Housing Authority partners in Home Key, including um, the Housing Authority of Riverside County. Um, their projects that are profiled here delivered opportunities for so many populations with a total of 107 units, um, delivering some set-asides for farm workers, LGBTQ plus youth, people living with HIV and AIDS, and vulnerable seniors. So really took the, the housing authority and the county of Riverside took a really holistic approach in levels of need and unmet need and really tried to focus their program design um, accordingly. Um, we could talk about these examples all day. At the end, uh, we'll share with you a link to a report that profiles um, these and 48 more awardees that, that all did this work with us. So this is a different project area than what we just discussed. And um, we use this slide to, to kind of illustrate the, the range of what we see throughout the state and um, our part of our adaptive reuse focus. Um, in the city of Fresno and in many other cities and counties throughout the state, there's, there's short-term and lower cost motels um, that are in cities sometimes concentrated in different strips of and streets in our early outreach that a lot of cities and counties, you know, we're already thinking about potential acquisitions like, like ones for these buildings. Um, and those cities and counties were discussing with our team that, you know, maybe they didn't want certain land use patterns for the long run within their communities, but they really recognized that while this may not have been the locality's ultimate land use vision for the area, these buildings provided an immediate opportunity 
for non-congregate shelter in Room Key, that program that Jeff mentioned, and or for permanent housing with some adaptation through Home Key. And it worked. Uh, as you heard from Jeff, um, we found that adaptive reuse was a really key strategy to work through Home Key at this pace, but it was not the only planning tool that was required. And so here are some of those tools or mechanics that supported expediency in the process. Um, we'll cover by right permit approvals, um, environmental review, streamlining or exemptions, um, and adaptive reuse. Again, a quick background here that the California budget process includes the governor's budget and a trailer bill or supporting legislation to implement that budget. And portions of the trailer bill not only enabled home key, but offered unique land use and policy conventions, which helped HCD remove barriers to housing people quickly. So the legislation also allowed us to su support them by providing that technical assistance. But again, luckily we were building on a conversation that had already been happening in our state legislature. And that is the ability to streamline permit authority and or the California Environmental Quality Act process or CEQA, um, which is our environmental review process, um, kind of like NEPA plus some nuances. Um, and that conversation with the legislature was really about ways that we can allow housing developments which meet certain conditions either by right or ministerially instead of a discretionary process. So first up, land use conformity. Instead of a process of a, a extensive conditional use permits, revising existing plans to ensure vertical consistency, uh, considering all the reviews and the time that it takes for those processes, the trailer bill authorized, and we're gonna read from the statute for just a second, that any project which used funds received from the coronavirus relief funds for home key shall be deemed consistent and in conformity with any applicable local plan, standard, or requirement, and is allowed as a permitted use by right without uh, not being subject to a conditional use permit, discretionary permit, or other discretionary reviews or approvals. This is so significant, and I'm certain that you can all understand that, but it felt like uh, one of the most important tools that enabled Home Key to work. I think the outcome is really just that we could, with a straight face, tell, their applicant, tell our applicants that if they could commit to this program, if they were serious about addressing COVID-19 and homelessness, then the state is authorizing the local government to approve this permit without delay, and we will support you every step of the way. And so the next question that everyone had was, well, what about environmental review? And this is also an important process, just end stop. Environmental review is important. Uh, it also can be time consuming and without guidance or expertise in the process, uh, it, environmental review can become a barrier um, to housing production. So there were already streamlining measures in the books before home keep, you know, other paths to navigate environmental review. But to continue removing barriers to home key projects, the legislature and the governor agreed there should be a new path for CEQA exemption that addressed home key specifically. And so the, the trailer bill included several if then statements and it, it to, to provide this CEQA exemption, but it is not a path that would work for all projects. It would work for some. Uh, so the outcome here was that if an applicant could not find another way to navigate CEQA, they could consider this new option, which was time limited, uh, but that it would allow the project to be approved again without delay. Now, what we actually found um, after our review of how uh, projects were navigating environmental review was that there, there really are many paths um, to navigating CEQA. Um, you know, as we've mentioned, there were existing buildings. Um, some, um, there's other processes like CEQA tiering and environmental review tiering that, that came to benefit here. And so not everyone used the CEQA exemption that was in our budget bill. Um, but to walk folks through this, we did that helpful technical assistance document with our Office of Planning and Research, which is not legal advice, uh, but really helps set the foundation and make sure that planners, local governments, and elected officials are on the same page about the tools that were available to get this done. And then uh, 
you know, again, just a quick mention of adaptive reuse and just the way that this supported expediency by looking at the built environment, looking for opportunities to accelerate housing production. It's important to know we also did new construction, but in the time frame that we had for, for round one, we really focused on adaptive reuse to cut development time and allow for more immediate housing opportunities. Uh, we aimed very high in this program even before we opened the gates, but you can consider that in late spring of 2020, we were not exactly sure how this would go. And the project, the program was popular really beyond our wildest dreams. And it was through some of these tools that we were able to lay the foundation for that success and garner uh, support by calling people in to remove barriers. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, it's really important that we continue to make space for not just adaptive reuse of hotels and motels, but we had one applicant, you know, navigate a commercial building and and modify that for housing. Um, there was also modular prefab and other, you know, acquisition of naturally occurring affordable housing, um, leveraging affordi affordability covenants and more to address housing and homelessness head on. So going back to that slide uh, or that image that we saw a couple slides ago, you can see in the background the same image of that strip of motels, but here with a little bit of an overlay about what the Fresno Housing Authority and their city partners did to invest in this neighborhood. Um, Fresno was one of 10 housing authorities that we partnered with um, as direct home key recipients and I'm really happy to share you know, how much this project has transformed properties to provide stable housing where there had been much more instability, uh, short-term rentals of motel rooms and really you know, challenges in securing sites and activities that were, were not conducive to, to stable and healthy housing. Um, and to that end, the Fresno Housing Authority will be delivering robust services to care for the whole person. And in these projects and throughout Home Key, we really see housing as the headstone to those solutions that center health, economic stability, mobility, and more. To that end, uh, we were able to bring Home Key together for this once in a lifetime opportunity. And to do that, we brought all our expertise, not only with those of us that are on the call today, um, which is, you know, represents our more programmatic and policy teams in the department, but our legal team, our contract team, admin, our executive team, everyone really with, with focus on getting this done to show that we were serious and supportive of all of our partners. Um, we focused on affirmatively furthering fair housing with a both and approach by supporting home key projects that are in areas of opportunity and in areas that need real and important community and development investments. So with that, I'd like to pass this off to Jeff to share some additional thoughts on this slide and introduce our next team member. Jeff. Thank you, Sasha. And so um, building off of this, you know, I think it's important that, uh, as you saw in Sasha's slides, we didn't want to be concentrating poverty. Uh, unfortunately, we know there's a history of that. And what we were really looking to make sure that Home Key did was to break that cycle and so could really serve as a catalyst to reinvigorate a community and to make sure that um, there was not displacement at the same time that there was reinvestment. And so really Home Key uh, allowed us in those partnerships, uh, you know, as an example with Fresno and and really I, I can't emphasize this enough. Partnerships between housing authorities, partnerships with housing departments, partnerships with community development departments and planning departments. These were the things that were so critically important to move our, our, these, these, these conversions through the process exceptionally fast so that we could serve uh, all the at-risk households. Likewise, the land use tool and the environmental streamlining and considerations that we went through in partnership with all of all of those partners. That is why we saw a dramatic decrease in the cost of converting and creating affordable housing. 
These are the lessons at the heart of Home Key. And again, it was about equity and collaboration. And so um, these are the lessons that we are pushing forward. And I would like to now take this opportunity to introduce Tim, who is really at the forefront of our planning on Home Key 2.0. Tim? Thank you so much, Jeff, and good afternoon, or actually good day, everyone. Uh, again, Tim Lawless, Branch Chief um, with the California Department of Housing and Community Development. And like Jeff said, um, you know, my team has the, the privilege, really, of helping implement uh, Home Key 2, and uh, in addition, some other homeless programming that we have here at the department. So I'm going to speak uh, briefly about our uh, Home Key 2 planning efforts. And I will actually follow suit and go off camera just to make sure that there are no uh, issues uh, hearing me as I, as I speak. Next slide, please. Oh, here we are. Perfect. Okay, so you just heard about the, you know, the first iteration of HomeKey, that, that sort of proof of concept. Um, you know, so given what we were able to achieve uh, that first time around, we are uh, just so pleased that the state legislature appropriated uh, a significant infusion of home key investments um, in the budget that that passed uh, just earlier this month. Uh, so, in terms of what that investment looks like, we have a total of 2.75 billion uh, appropriated across two fiscal years. Um, so, of that 2.75, uh, 2.2 is coming from the Federal uh, American Rescue Plan Act that was just signed uh, last spring. And that's going to be used on the, on the capital side. So for expenses like acquisition and, and rehabilitation and, and related uh, expenses. Uh, and we think these funds uh, could bring, you know, another 13 to 14,000 units uh, or more uh, online uh, over the life cycle of the program, which is super exciting. Uh, and then the balance, um, or 550 million, is actually from our our state general fund, and will be used uh, primarily to support uh, project operations, uh, which is critical because we want to make sure that these these projects are uh, are sustainable uh, over time. Uh, and then in terms of deploying these funds, uh, we really want to continue the momentum of of Home Key One. Um, and we know, frankly, that a lot of communities out there already have projects that they're queuing up and they're, they're eager to, to get started. So we have a very ambitious goal of making these funds available uh, in September, which is, which is right around the corner. Uh, fortunately, we do have three years um, to get these funds uh, spent, though. So that'll give uh, you know, the communities that are, are ready to go access to the funding uh, here soon but also give some flexibility uh, from a timeline perspective so that if communities uh, are perhaps not ready to go sort of out of the gate, uh, they'll have some time to you know, source potential sites, develop partnerships, and you know, submit, submit a strong application when, when the time comes. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of uh, you know the policy, the broad policy considerations that we're weighing uh, as we as we plan to deploy uh, this investment, uh, first and foremost, we want to continue making sure that units are created and brought online so that folks can continue to be housed quickly. Um, we saw a large number of hotel moto acquisitions last time. Um, so much so that the, the program almost became synonymous with that, um, which is great, and that and that and that may well continue. Um, but we also want to ensure that jurisdictions are uh, aware of and have the support that they need to pursue uh, all the other eligible home key project types. And we heard about some of them earlier. Um, you know, using modular construction, uh, the acquisition of uh, multi-family buildings, the acquisition of single-family homes, uh, master leasing, you know, even even office commercial conversions where where that makes sense. So we think, you know, we think elevating and supporting the pursuit of these other uses um, is going to help expand the pool of potential projects and ensure that these funds are uh, deployed impactfully. 
Uh, and then the next consideration is really sort of balancing, you know, flexibility with with urgency. Um, although we have three years to spend uh, these funds, uh, urgency is still a cornerstone, you know, of this program. Um, we really want to make sure that we are moving at a pace that is responsive to the homelessness crisis that uh, we're facing here in the state of California, which many of you know is is quite formidable. Um, as well as you know this pandemic that we're that we're still facing and that is that is still uh, impacting us. Uh, so with that in mind, the updated Home Key statute uh, actually does have a requirement that acquisition and rehabilitation uh, expenses, um, all that work sort of be completed within within eight months of the time that an award is made. So there is that sort of predefined uh, deadline, if you will, that's built in the statute. There is some some flexibility in terms of our department being able to offer extensions uh, as as they're warranted, but there really is this emphasis on um, getting projects done and occupied in you know in eight months or or, or maybe a bit longer in some cases, which um, is is certainly not as fast as we saw uh, the first time around, but is still quite a bit faster than than traditional uh, new construction. Uh, at the same time, as I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, uh, that longer expenditure deadline really will allow us to make awards uh, more on a rolling basis. Um, so jurisdictions can come to us, you know, when they're ready, uh, rather than having to scramble, to, you know, to put together a, a project within, you know, a potentially short uh, application deadline period. So we're hopeful that there's a really good balance this time around, you know, between um, moving quickly, but also um, providing the flexibility that communities need to submit strong projects. Okay, also wanted to, you know, continue to drive home this point of, of project sustainability. Um, this time around, we want to continue to help jurisdictions explore all these different um, resources that can help them support these project operation expenses, you know, post 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 acquisition um, we know a lot of uh, resources are coming down at the federal level of course uh, you know including these emergency housing vouchers um, we are also quite fortunate to have a, a large state budget uh, surplus this year um, so in addition to the expansion of home key there's actually quite a bit of other uh, state funding um, being delivered to locals uh, some actually administered by other state departments that that pairs really well with home key. Um, so our, our goal uh, is really to help jurisdictions sort of knit all these different pots of funding together so that these projects can be uh, sustainable over the long term. Um, we want to help communities sort of identify all the different resources that they can use that pair nicely with home key. And um, of course, where there are still gaps, we are fortunate to have that 550 million in general fund that I referenced earlier to to help further promote sustainability. So we're really thankful for that. Okay, on the on the equity side, um, you know Jeff and Sasha spoke very eloquently about this. We want to continue to emphasize uh, equity. We want to continue ensuring that communities up and down the state can continue to access this funding because there really is you know, a need all over the state. And like was uh, you know, said earlier, um, we've had a lot of communities uh, you know, in, home, in, in Home Key One that applied that normally don't apply for our funding or that have difficulty accessing our funding uh, for various reasons. Uh, we wanna continue that momentum, continue that trend and, and continue our uh, commitment to helping uh, all communities throughout the state um, you know, increase uh, their housing supply uh, for for the home key target population, um, and then likewise, you know, incentivizing, continuing to incentivize uh, strategies that promote racial equity. Um, that's a huge uh, issue, as as many of you know, in the homeless response system, and we want to make sure that. Um, our applicants are thinking through those strategies, both in terms of their homeless response system writ large, as well as how they are uh, going about occupying uh, home key uh, uh, units in, in projects. So 
We certainly started that conversation um, in Home Key One, but now that we have uh, a little bit of an opportunity to take a breath and, and, and think about it further, we, we want to redouble our efforts uh, in that space and continue um, to help communities think through that very important issue. Okay, on the on the streamlining piece, um, Sasha did a great job covering this, um, but it, it really just can't be emphasized enough how important this is in terms of both both the buy right permitting um, as well as the, uh, the the pathway that's that was created for um, you know the environmental review or CEQA exemption uh, if you know if certain conditions are met. Um, that was in the Home Key statute in in 1.0. Uh, we're fortunate that it continues to be in the Home Key statute for 2.0. So that will be just key to helping communities um, move forward with these projects because it, of course, you know, promotes that certainty and it promotes that, uh, that speed to getting these projects done and getting these projects uh, occupied. Uh, and then the final piece that is an area of particular focus, and this was sort of touched on already and, and cuts across uh, the five other um, sort of policy considerations I have here on the slide is technical assistance. Uh, again, committed to ensuring that communities can access these funds um, and um, certainly want to uh, ensure that um, all applicants have all the help they need, whether it's from, from our department or, um, you know, the many partners that were, uh, you know, mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and just to give sort of one brief example of how we sort of rejiggered our, our internal processes to, to make this program work, you know, in Home Key One, we essentially assigned each applicant a single point of contact uh, within our department. From the time, uh, even before they submitted an application, but first reached out, first reached out to us, all the way through until um, an award was issued. And we called these we called these staff uh, ambassadors. And uh, the approach really ensured that applicants, uh, you know, were always working with someone who knew the details of their project and could quickly respond and could quickly sort of research questions, provide answers, provide resources, and uh, just generally were able to help uh, get the, you know, get that project over the finish line. So this is a model, you know, we certainly intend to continue. Uh, in Home Key 2, we heard great things about it from our, from our applicants. And we think it's going to be, you know, foundational, frankly, to the, you know, robust customer service orientation that is really foundational to to to, to home key success. So, um, so that is, you know, those are some of the some of the broad um, points we wanted to highlight for for home key two, in in how we're thinking about this funding, um, and. Uh, with that, I will actually hand it back over to uh, my colleague, Jeff Ross. Thanks, Tim. Sasha, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So I want to, you know, begin closing our, our remarks with saying that, you know, again, multiple folks around the country, different states, cities, and counties are looking to carry on uh, what, we, what we've been working on here in California, and we're really excited. Uh, for the conversations that we've been having and, you know, all the, the great planning and, and efforts that are underway. But I want to point out, as part of the American Rescue Plan, there was a $5 billion national allocation um, that is coming through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as a special subset of the Home Investment Partnership Program, and it's known as Home ARP, which is Home American Rescue Plan. And it is really... Um, conceptually the federal version of, of what home key is. And, um, and so HUD will be in the fall releasing um, their guidance uh, as to how these funds will be utilized and deployed. Um, and they will probably uh, most likely by around January be in a position to execute standard agreements uh, and, and, and grant awards with participating jurisdictions around the country and, and allow for that $5 billion to really begin to deploy. So the opportunity for this work to happen in many more communities than, than what uh, are even cur currently have been contemplating this work is, is now uh, going to be uh, substantially greater. 
Uh, in California, we're really looking at because we have such a sizable home key 2.0 allocation uh, that uh, was enacted by the governor and the legislature. We're really trying to make sure that we target the home ARP funds for very specific subsets. One of the key things to consider is though, as, as these will be HUD funds, NEPA, and many of you deal with NEPA around the country, is going to be embedded into how to think about project development and, and how to work quickly. We don't have the ability with federal um, environmental review to streamline necessarily quite in the same ways that we did with uh, California's uh, environmental review policies. But there are ways that we can conceptualize projects, identify sites and localities that we know can reduce the, the review time, the level of assessment that needs to occur to continue to, to make sure that speed uh, is, is a, a, a critical aspect of what we're trying to deliver. And of course, always thinking about uh, labor compliance, the Davis-Bacon rules. Um, those are things that are not going to be waived as part of the home ARP process. But again, with thoughtful planning, uh, can be navigated relatively uh, quickly and allow for these funds to deploy. So I wanted to make sure as, as we um, get to the question and answer portion that we highlight that this Im important resource, in addition to all the other resources that have been coming down from the federal government, uh, is getting ready to, to come to uh, many of our communities around the country. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, one more slide. So as, as we're, as we're uh, getting ready to go into the question and answers, we want to make sure that we highlight uh, several resources that we have uh, regarding uh, what we've learned, uh, you know, the details, uh, individual case studies, report back to our legislature, uh, you know, independent reviews of, of this work. So that way you all have access uh, to resources beyond just the three of us as to how this work has been going, the impacts it's been having out in the communities. With that, I'd like to end our prepared remarks and happily uh, ready to jump into question and answers. And I am on the phone, so I'm gonna attempt to turn on the, uh, the webcam, and if that doesn't work, can always uh, turn that back off. Wonderful, thank you. All right, there you all are. Okay, uh, folks, again, if you have questions, just type them in your chat box and we'll see what, what all we can get to today. All right, so um, let's dive in. This first one, let's start with you, Jeff. Um, does the Home Key program apply to those residents affected by home loss through uh, wildfire or let's just say any natural disaster? Yeah, so I guess it, let's it, back up and say what how do you qualify? You basically uh need well not need to be I, I should say you know I want to make sure I'm very conscious of how I word and phrase things here. Home key was about creating permanent housing solutions for those that are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we have affordable housing solutions and ample, you know, resources traditionally has been congregate shelter, but now really realizing that a great way to serve people and to make sure that we address the needs that, that so many folks have is to now provide non-congregate sheltering um, solutions. And, and all of those sheltering solutions link to permanent housing solutions. It's important to note that California is a housing first state by law, which means everything we do is about providing either shelter or housing as rapidly as possible and wrapping services around based on that, not having services first and then housing. So that is, again, a key component to what we're trying to do. It, it, it's by law. It's how we've designed everything. But Home Key uh, and Home ARP ultimately will be uh, implemented where it's about serving those that are literally homeless or at risk of homelessness uh, you know, with very specific definitions. Thank you. Um, related to conversions to permanent housing, will the state of California provide additional funds to previously awarded acquisition projects for rehab related to the conversions? 
Yes, uh, we will. And we're looking at, um, you know, different uh, funding sources that will become available for, for that because we know ultimately uh, conversion is, is our end goal. It's important to note in the, in the state budget this year, $1.75 billion uh, was allocated to, to take care of tax credit backlogs. So that way, several, pro you know, hundreds of projects around the state have received funds and have been awaiting tax credits. We've been oversubscribed. This funding will really allow for that backlog to be cleared. And so as the home key projects that have previously been awarded through uh, the first round of home key um, are ready to go through conversion. The goal is, is for tax credits to be available to help support that. Likewise, we've used a, a portion of our community development block grant coronavirus funds uh, to, uh, we've made those available to help with conversions already. So that, that is an open application that is already available to our partners. We know folks that are applying right now. And so we're going to continue to be looking at other resources and ways to make sure that we get units built and converted um, as quickly as possible up and down the state. If I may add just one thing as well, that um, while we've talked a lot today about adaptive reuse and you know, showed projects that need a, more of a push um, for rehabilitation, we did have some projects that were ready to be permanent supported housing right out the gate. And that was maybe a, um, a more expensive asset on acquisition, but the time saved of not needing to position or recompete for funds um, was a decision that some localities made to pay more for an acquisition, um, but then not have to deal with competitive funding rounds later. So we've been trying to learn from all of these examples. And um, again, that was through partnership and a lot of uh, coordination to make sure that those opportunities were even able to be done in, in such rapid pace. But um, some of the one project that I'm thinking of had you know, such low rehab cost and you know, less than a couple thousand dollars per door, really just for some painting. Uh, but other than that, it was ready to be permanent supported housing immediately. So also important to note, not every project is going to come back for state funds. Thank you. Um, related to this, I'm seeing a couple questions come in regarding, okay, so we have funding to acquire. We have the funding um, to, uh, to, to update and um, to make the changes necessary. Okay, so what about ongoing operation maintenance from, from that point forward? Um, after you've acquired, after you know, you, you've made your changes, um, where does the money come next? Where, how do we keep this going? Jim, I would love for you to be able to talk about the ways that uh, you and your team are really looking at that ongoing need. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such an important question. Um, I alluded to it in, in my part of the presentation, but didn't go into great detail. Um, so I would say a couple of things. And for the um, for the first batch of home key awardees, the state was able to ensure that every jurisdiction received an award for project operations, either from our state general fund or from some of our philanthropic partners that we were fortunate to have in, in 1.0. Um, we also required that um, applicants show three years of operations of funding to us so that we knew for at least five years these, these projects were on solid footing. Uh, now, moving forward, um, and I, and I mentioned this earlier, there is um, you know, a sizable investment coming, coming down from our state budget to our local, uh, what are called continuums of care, uh, our counties and some of our large cities uh, on the magnitude of, of $2 billion, $1 billion this year, $1 billion uh, next fiscal year. That's um, quite flexible uh, local funding. And it, it, it explicitly pairs quite nicely with, uh, with HomeKey. So we are working very closely with all the uh, HomeKey One awardees to kind of think about this issue, um, help them realize sort of what's out there already, um, including this new funding that's coming down out of the state budget. And that will certainly continue um, as we continue to work with all the HomeKey Two uh, applicants that are gonna be coming to the table here uh, shortly. And I like to add, in addition to those those funds, right, um, 
We know we can capitalize operating reserves. That is one way that stabilizes a project. And generally every 15 to 20 years, uh, projects come in for new tax credits, get recapitalized. Um, so that along with, with these uh, several billion dollars that can be paired that, that Tim's alluding to, really begins to change the cash flow equation on projects. Likewise, again, I, want, I can't emphasize this enough, partnership with your housing authorities and the vouchers, whether they're project-based vouchers or you're just receiving vouchers, that creates a solid revenue stream through rents that can be counted on to help pay for services. We have this massive deployment nationally on uh, the new emergency vouchers. And so, again, looking at the underwriting, yes, uh, when you're looking at project-based vouchers, that you're able to, to borrow more and things like that. But there is a very strategic use of even just the regular tenant-based vouchers and the, the knowing that you can receive uh, a, a specific, uh, you know, rental income stream that can then help, you know, be leveraged with all these other sources. So I just want to make sure that I add that piece to the conversation because these are very significant resources. And on the emergency vouchers, these are to specific families and they stay with those families as long as they need it. And then when the family no longer needs it, uh, it disappears. So a lot of folks call these disappearing vouchers. One would argue that we provide these disappearing vouchers to the households with the greatest need because those households will have a longer time probably of needing assistance, linking those households with those vouchers, linking those households to units being created, creates longer revenue streams for the projects, creates better stability for the projects, but also provides housing and stability for those households. So just want to make sure that everyone's thinking along those lines as well. Thank you. So what is the anticipated length of time that folks will be in these units? Is there, and is there, you know, before they move on to more permanent housing, is there um, a hard stop date? 85% of these units are permanent housing. Um, and so there is no, folks folks are, are free to live there as, as long as they desire and want. We know in our other permanent housing programs, that can mean well over a decade before folks move, which we're very excited for. For the folks in the temporary, uh, you know, non-congregate uh, aspects of the program, you know, this again is where we're trying to use housing first, and we're trying to get to folks moving from a, a shelter environment to permanent housing as rapidly as possible. Our greatest limitations up and down the state is access to quality, affordable housing. And so, you know, that, that piece is some communities, we can move folks very quickly, less than 30 days. Other communities, we, it takes us, you know, upwards of 90 to 100 days on average. And of course, there's outliers that even take longer than that. What we need to get to and why you hear the urgency from us is that we need to just produce a lot more units and we need those units to be um, affordable and sustainable, both for the operators and for the individuals in them. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that no day um, is wasted in, in moving folks out. Um, but ultimately, you know, our ability to, to be 90 days or less means that we've got to produce thousands of more units. And what you heard Tim say is we're hoping to produce another 13, 14,000 units uh, with HomeKey 2.0. Uh, that would mean that we've produced 20,000 units if we're successful through home key uh, two rounds. And again, we're trying to layer uh, home ARP and all these other resources coming in from, from the federal government. Um, again, the National Housing Trust Fund, one that's available to everyone as well. We have, we have really targeted those funds um, uh, very specifically to also support these so that there's an ongoing stream even beyond the one-time allocations of home and, and um, the home key program. Thank you. Um, are there social services tied to this program? Jim, again, I'm going to defer to you and all the work that your team's doing. Yep, uh, great question, absolutely. And um, getting back to Jeff's emphasis on housing first, we are a housing first state. Um, we want folks to be permanently housed, which will help um, greatly with the stability process, but it has to be paired with services. And all of our projects have on-site services um, or access to services off-site, but we very much require that in, in HomeKey 1, and it will continue to be um, 
something that we're looking at closely in in 2.0 to make sure that there is uh, you know that that our home key occupants and clients have access to what they need to to stabilize and and move forward. And likewise, likewise, we work uh, quite closely with the Department of Social Services at the state level, who has a number of different funding streams that provide services to different you know subpopulations, including families, uh, including the chronically homeless, including homeless seniors and others. So again, it comes comes down to sort of that technical assistance about how to how to knit these different funding streams and uh, support services all together to make sure that our our clients have the the support and stability that they need. I'd add one more thing that um, that focus on services was even part of the land use authority that we had. So the exemption from CEQA, our Environmental um, Quality Act, <laughs> included that you could use that CEQA exemption. And so long as you didn't increase the building footprint by 10%, and that increase in building footprint may have been required to provide the amount of services that are needed on the site. So this is something that is very well accepted um, through the legislature, the governor's office, certainly within our department and other state departments that it's housing plus um, and thinking about connection on site as well as to other community amenities. So you'll see how we scored not only access to services and the provision of those services on site, but other amenities within a community like access to grocery stores and access to transportation which helped the whole picture come together for people to be successful and stable within housing. Those weren't necessarily, aside from services, not a threshold item, but it shows us that the applicant is thinking about that connection to the larger community, thinking about stability, but we also did it for another reason, was that those same amenities help compete for other funding program scoring criteria. So there was a lot of masterminding and thinking about how to bring all of this together and making sure that properties are set up for immediate and long-term success, all in the support of the households that will live there. Thank you. So um, let's say a community anywhere in the U.S. is is thinking, you know what, there there is this um, extended stay type hotel and it's been vacant for a year and we would love to turn it into some either affordable housing or temporary housing for um, at-risk families, what do they need to do? What do they need to be thinking about from the planner's perspective? Do they need to be thinking about zoning? Do they need to be thinking about um, what uh, neighborhood, you know, what the people around them, how they're going to respond, the nimbyism of things? Um, what, what, are the, what are the things that they need to start thinking about? Asha, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think this is all part of the community conversation that it was for within California, and we would suggest, uh, as Jeff mentioned, even as we talk to our national partners, this is all part of it, um, really an ongoing conversation about the housing needed within a community and how we get community members and elected officials getting to say yes to housing. Because if we don't, there's a lot of the economists, a lot of negative externalities that happen when we do not have enough housing. And really, I mean, at the core of the household level, being forced to make impossible decisions between housing and food and health and all the other things and getting to your job. And so really centering community conversations around that, around existing community members. And there's great research to show that people are not by and large traveling to experience homelessness, but are staying as the neighbors, but just now are unsheltered in the same community that they lived in, grew up in. And so these really are our neighbors. And so I think starting there is really important. And that is certainly our approach and not trying to other um, our neighbors. Um, but we are not in control of all the conversations at the local level. So we have a very unique framework um, that a lot of planners learned about in planning school about our general plan and our housing element. And so our housing element is, is part of um, this conversation, um, really thinking about what need exists in a community. And so I think for any community and anywhere um, should be thinking about what is our existing housing stock? What do we know from demographics? What kind of changes are our population going to experience, whether it's supporting aging in place or large families that are at risk of homelessness? And thinking about the range of opportunities, both in vacant land, we try and activate our own state-owned land 
um, as well as encourage localities to think about their land holdings in addition to looking for adaptive reuse opportunities. So it's really like we got to bring everything to the table to address this urgent need um, to make sure that people can be safely housed. Um, yes, I think it's important to look at zoning and to think about creative ways that we can not just take project by project level use of this, um, but we've done work on objective design standards and specific plan areas to make sure that we are allowing for a broad range of uses that support the community vision while also ensuring that we're not creating unique barriers to saying yes to housing and throwing up rules that um, throughout a process of development end up costing time and expense that make housing more infeasible and less affordable. Um, so it's all part of this conversation. We actually have some, we have a lot of tools on our website, happy to share, feel free to reach out to me. Um, our planning grant program approaches several ways to take these, you know, um, well-researched strategies to accelerate housing production, bring it all on the table, have it be part of the community conversation to figure out what can work best in your community so that you're ready, hopefully not for another pandemic, but to keep this process moving um, and house people as quickly as possible. So we have planning grant tools on our website um, as well as other materials. So happy to be a resource after the call today. And I would just like to highlight um, the city of Mendocino uh, was a, a, a community that really hadn't done this before. And it was uh, an amazing partnership, state, county, city, nonprofits. And uh, as planners, I think everyone knows that you have to engage community. And so we had several community uh, conversations where um, the state senator was in the room, uh, myself was in the room, uh, the, the mayor, the, board, uh, the chair of the board of uh, supervisors for the county, the, the CEO for the county, the city manager, and the planning directors were all there and talked about at very directly all the concerns in the community. And what happened is they took a leap of faith. They, they converted a, a, a motel very much uh, as the example that you, you gave. And what we have heard on the backside now, you know, six, eight months after it's been opened and fully occupied, is how much of a tremendous impact this has made positively for the community, how many folks in their community they didn't even realize truly needed this type of uh, a facility and help and service. And they are really eagerly looking at how can do, they continue this work, do more, um, and it's been a really positive outcome. So I just want to highlight there was one one example of, of again we had 51 partners around the uh, the state doing this that um, you know really just jumps to mind as to you know going through a, a really robust planning process in a very short period of time that has had tremendous positive impacts. Thank you. Um, so we often, you know, th there is a, uh, a national conversation that's been going on about housing now for at least a year about the lack of just housing in general, the lack of affordable housing. Can we just talk for a moment about the term affordable housing um, and what that actually means for any, any place, you know? So for example, affordable housing in San Francisco might look different than affordable housing here in Cleveland. Um, so how, I guess, how do you, how do you, how do you term affordable housing and how do you determine what's considered affordable? Yeah, you know, I, I, that's a great question. And that was at really at the heart of our planning because, you know, I know a lot of folks, can, you know, think about California and they think about our large coastal cities, San Francisco, LA, very high cost. But we also have areas of the state that are not high cost, that are very rural, very remote. Um, and incomes, you know, vary widely um, throughout the, the vast geography of California. And so I think it's a, it, it is a good uh, example of, of how to think about it nationally. And, and to your point is affordability looks differently in different places. And that's why we broke the state up into eight regions, because housing is a regional asset. It's tied to the economics and where people have jobs. It's tied to transportation and services and all those amenities. And, and there's a direct related cost to all of that and, and that we need to account for. And so ultimately affordability means that we don't want households paying more than a third of their income 
for, for where they live. We want the quality of their housing to be high. We want folks to be in housing that can be maintained, um, that, uh, you know, they're not, we, we've all heard the statistics that the majority of Americans are one major expense in a month away from going down a cycle of not being able to pay all their bills that can perpetuate and build on itself. Um, and so what we want to make sure is that we're producing an array of housing, housing types, uh, number of, uh, of rooms within the, within the housing um, that is affordable for the, for the different households that need to occupy them. And that's where we've fallen dramatically short. Um, and so that's why as we've looked at um, designing uh, our program and, and really trying to be flexible, we've looked at what do we need to do to lower those barriers so that, that we're not adding undue costs. I can't emphasize enough that development partners' costs go up for lots of reasons, labor, uh, materials, and we're seeing that uh, right now in the, as a result of natural disasters and the pandemic, supply chain uh, interruptions. But one of the biggest reasons that costs increase on housing is the risk of will that housing be approved, the NIMBY factor. The one thing that we got at in the heart of this program was addressing that. Again, we didn't duck community conversations, but we said we can, we can say and, and clearly articulate that this is in conformance with land use. The long-term conversion, the long-term repositioning of these sites Absolutely, there's robust community conversation, but we can occupy these now and serve people today while we go through and make sure that these projects really meet the, the, the needs of the individuals and the community that they're in in the long term. And that's a crucial, crucial piece. There's a reason that anywhere we went in the state, it was $150,000 to $200,000 less to produce a home key unit than a comparable unit in another program. And that lesson can be perpetuated around the country. And that can mean affordability regardless of where you live. Because if you take that much cost out of the equation, that also means there's, there might be additional dollars for service deployments and, and, and other amenities to be located that reduce costs overall, right? And so as we're looking at what are the impacts, the long-term impacts of, of the pandemic, there is a lot of commercial space that was marginal before the pandemic. That is not gonna be reoccupied, but you know what? It is in phenomenal locations that can reduce transportation and other costs for households that can then be part of the housing cost considerations that make overall permanent housing solutions more affordable overall. And that's what we need to be doing as policymakers and as planners making sure that we are thinking about these things at the core of our, our project decision making. Okay. Well, guess what? It's 2.30. I told you guys we would run out of time before we ran out of questions. Um, so thanks to you all for, for joining us, Jeff, Sasha, Tim. Um, this is a great program. I'm so glad that you guys were able to come on and kind of explain it. I, I hope it got wheels turning on uh, in, in, uh, for all of our attendees. Um, just a quick couple of reminders. Log your CM credits. Uh, the slide deck will be available as a PDF on our webcast webpage. And at the very end of the slide deck, our panelists have graciously included a series of resources, of links for, for more information. Um, so you can find that on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And we are recording this. We'll have it up on our YouTube channel. And the link to that will also be on our webcast webpage probably sometime on Monday. And folks, don't forget to register for some of our upcoming sessions. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out directly to our panelists or you can get a hold of me and I can get a hold of panelists for you. So thanks again to our panelists for joining us today and uh, the Housing and Community Development Division of APA for hosting today. Everyone have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.